This video is a continuation of our last video where we talked about the events that will lead to the end of the world. In particular, we talk about the ancient prophecy of Ragnarok as it exists within the Dungeons and Dragons multiverse. This prophecy is interesting because it exists on Planescape, on the Forgotten Realms, and on many setting agnostic books from Dungeons and Dragons. So on that video, we covered the great battle of Ragnarok in great death, and we talked about why the fall of Isgard would be devastating for the general state of the multiverse, and we talked about who would be the one who would trigger that end of the world. But in that conversation, we left out a very crucial and extremely important character who will very much be the one who will put the final nail in the coffin that is reality. Today, we will talk about Nidhogg, the serpent dragon that is fated to devour Yggdrasil. Now, who is Nidhogg in D&D? Well, you will see, but first... This video is brought to you by Aurora, Age of Desolation, a campaign setting set in the Sundered World where each leftover moat of Earth is manipulated and governed by a powerful dragon. The Shattered World houses five different biomes, each more dangerous than the last, from electrified deserts to tangled marshes that rain acid. This planet is not for the meek, and with this book you will be able to have a campaign focused on survival and exploration. And one of the most forgotten pillars of gameplay within D&D is exploration. Not many books really focus on it, and so Aurora has come out swinging, promising new rules and new mechanics to deal with environments. We're talking environmental challenges with actual rules to them. This is what you would need in a world of extremes, and that is, at the end of the day, the beauty of campaign settings, is it not? Rules perfectly defined for the setting in which they are at. But the thing about Aurora is that the setting is a shattered world with multiple biomes, so you could, in fact, very easily grab Prazolar, the icy biome, on the book and all of his rules for survival and simply put it into your snow-based campaign. This way you could get the best out of all worlds. You get to use the great environmental rules, amazing inspiration from the book into how a desolate and dangerous snowy biome can be, and you would get to play in your own world as well. The power would be in your hands. Aurora Age of Desolation is currently on Kickstarter, only 15 days remaining for it, so if you don't want to miss out, go over now and pledge yourself for a copy today. The book is coming from the same guys that made Grim Hollow, so you know that there is some great quality, not just in the writing, but especially in the art. These guys always blow it out of the water with their art. Click the link in the description and check it out, Aurora Age of Desolation. But now, back to the video. So who or what exactly is Nidhogg? Here's the thing. Yggdrasil, the World Ash, is an intraplanar gateway that connects everything. You can reach it through the astral plane, through most of the outer planes, and even on planets within the prime material realm. Effectively, if a planet venerates the Norse gods, then Yggdrasil stretches its roots or branches over to that planet in some way. If you can find any of these branches, then you can walk into them and find yourself at the trunk of this great planar tree, and from this tree, you can go anywhere within the multiverse where the tree connects. Traversing it, however, is difficult since you never know where the branches might lead. But one thing is certain, if you go all the way up, you will always get to Isgard. And if you go all the way down, you will always get to Niflheim, the second layer of Hades, also known as the Grey Waste. This is where the main roots of the Great Tree reside. And also, here is where you will likely find Nidhogg. So, some texts claim that she is a guardian, but others claim that she doesn't really care about who passes around her. That she is mostly there just focused on devouring the dead, and that as long as you don't disturb her, then you can pass into Hades without issues. Some texts also claim that she is entrapped down there by the roots of Yggdrasil who keep her contained, while others claim that she is out there out of her own volition, but in either story, she's represented as actively eating the roots of the Great Tree. And just to clear out any confusions before we continue, Garm is the death hound that protects the entrance to Niflheim, like an actual guard dog, who you will find if you traverse the caves that lead from the bottom of Yggdrasil into actual Niflheim. Whereas Nidhogg is a serpent dragon that is found at the roots of Yggdrasil. But anyways, moving on. What's fascinating about Nidhogg is that she does participate in Ragnarok somewhat, but at least as far as the D&D's equivalent of Ragnarok is concerned, she doesn't make an appearance in the actual war of Ragnarok. Instead, what we know is that she is fated to devour Yggdrasil, and we also know that if Yggdrasil falls, 
then the Norse deities would lose their magic, since of course, their power does come from the tree. Now, normally this would be where it ends. A Nidhogg would just be an auxiliary character that would tangentially participate in the downfall of Isgard. However, the D&D book Champions of Ruin, which is a Forgotten Realms specific source, says that Nidhogg is in fact Dindar, the Night Serpent, and just like that, things get unimaginably more interesting. So, let's talk about it. So, Dendar the Night Serpent is what is considered an Elder Evil or a Primordial, depending on the classification. See, imagine these entities like your sorcerer. Your sorcerer draws its power from itself, and you don't necessarily study your magic like a wizard, or are given your magic by someone else like a warlock or a priest would. You simply have it within you. And you could have gotten this power by, say, drinking from the Fountain of Youth, or, or diving deep into a storm of suffused magic, or perhaps you have the blood of another powerful creature in your veins. And there is a gazillion reasons why your body might have power. Now, that is effectively what defines an Elder Evil or a Primordial, except that these creatures are so powerful that they defy the rules of reality. Some of them equal or even eclipse gods, and many of them exist within completely different realities that would be difficult for us to even fathom. Most of these creatures got their powers by just being there at the dawn of reality, bathing from the primordial soup of magic that created existence. Uh, these can range from all of the Cthulhu type of monsters to the elemental lords of the elemental planes, to even some dragons that became immortal for one reason or another and have lived for millennia to the point where they have grown so big and powerful that they have outgrown some deities in power. For whatever reason, these creatures are godlike in power. Now, gods, on the other hand, obtain their power from the faith of their followers or from another deity. Many of these gods attune themselves to a strong philosophical concept and then become powerful when that concept concept is revered. At least, uh, that is the difference as it exists now. Now, back in the beginning of things, uh, differences were certainly more nuanced. And as far as the gods would tell you now, the differences were merely that the primordials were agents of destruction while the gods were agents of stability and creation. But anyways, uh, this is important because way back in the history of the Forgotten Realms, the planet of Toril became one of the many planets in which a galactic war emerged between the gods and the primordials. Uh, deities are extremely powerful, as you know, and they have unbelievable protections, as you would imagine, but the thing about primordials is that some of them are so powerful that they just straight up break the rules as one would expect. One of these primordials was in fact Dendar the Night Serpent. So Dendar has the incredible ability of being able to eat the dreams of both mortals and gods, specifically their nightmares I should say. Uh, the lore states plainly that gods can indeed dream, and that Dendar can siphon these dreams and get sustenance from it, but further, that Dendar becomes more powerful the more nightmares she consumes. We also know that gods can be damaged and even killed in this fashion, so as you can see, uh, Dindar wasn't just like another primordial on this war. She was crucial and one of the most powerful primordials of this time. In fact, one of the most unbelievable actions that Dendar took during this event, uh, which we call the Dawn War by the way, is that she literally unironically devoured the sun that illuminated the solar system of the planet Toril. Uh, the planet where the Forgotten Realms setting is set. This caused a mass extinction event where everything died on the planet. And we actually do not know what existed before then because everything just literally died. The only thing that we believe might have survived it would have to be perhaps the Avaliths, since the lore state that they existed before the gods but other than them, we, we actually have no idea. Now anyways, the only reason why the Primordials, and in particular Dandar, were defeated was because they were betrayed by another Primordial. You would know him as Uptau the Betrayer. Now as a player or as a DM, you, you would have heard of Uptau as the God of Chult, so if you played Tomb of Annihilation, you should certainly know about him. Uh, he's in fact technically a Primordial, not a God, but because of his role in betraying his fellow Primordials, he was granted honorary God status and was allowed to settle in Chult and was given it as his to rule. And if you were curious, that is actually why Uptau doesn't have to answer prayers, because he technically doesn't gain any power from having followers. Or I should say, most of his power doesn't come from followers. You can always have followers and become even more powerful, but he doesn't have to do that. Anyways, uh, the betrayal itself was interesting. Uptau knew that Dendar was going to destroy everything, and so he prepared a plan. Uh, Dendar wanted to recuperate from some of the wounds that she had gotten in the war, and Uptau offered to protect her as she 
slept. He deceived her, of course, and while she slept, he imprisoned her in a powerful planar cage that effectively prevented her from fully forming in the prime material realm. Now, the nature of this prison is very intriguing because Dendar is not literally imprisoned in a cage, but rather a portion of her, like, like her essence or something. Now, remember that primordials of Dendar's level of power just kind of defy reason, or sometimes even logic. It's hard to tell exactly what happened, but basically for eons, Dendar has had a physical body that exists in the lower planes. She can move around however she wants in the lower planes, but she can't leave the outer planes. The trap or cage that Uptel made for her exists with a metaphysical door, a door which physically resides in Cholt, presumably put there by Uptel himself once he was given dominion over the jungle peninsula. So basically, Dendar is trapped on the lower planes unless this metaphysical door in Cholt is to be opened. And this is where the prophecy begins. The Forgotten Realms has a prophecy that if Dendar were to ever escape those doors, then the world would end. That is because Dendar would immediately devour the sun again and usher an age of darkness upon the world and all shall die. Uptal was given a task by the gods to protect this door, and if Dendar were to ever come out, then Upta would have to be the one to fight her. Now, the door can indeed be opened by mortals, though it would require tremendous amounts of power and knowledge, or it can be opened by Dendar herself. See, and, and this is the, uh, the interesting part, uh, whether it is because Dendar once devoured this solar system's sun, or whether it is because the metaphysical door to her imprisonment lies on Toril, or because she was born on this planet, which is also a possibility, uh, she appears to have a strong connection to this planet, and so she can actually devour the nightmares of the inhabitants of this planet even though she is imprisoned. Uh, this doesn't actually hurt anyone that lives on the planet, by the way. In fact, if anything, she kind of does the inhabitants of this planet a service. Uh, all those times when you feel like you've had a, a bad dream, but you can't quite remember what it was, those are the dreams that Dendor has eaten. It is said that if she wasn't around to do that, then you would vividly remember your worst nightmares, which would probably be terrible. But in any case, her eating those nightmares makes her stronger. And the lore states that when she has eaten enough and has become strong enough, she will be able to escape her prison and destroy the world. So basically, we don't even need someone to open the door for her. She will eventually get to do it herself. Now, if you're interested, there's actually a really cool adventure which I recommend reading for yourself. It is an Adventurer's League adventure for level 17 characters set in Cholt. Now, I know that not everyone considers Adventurer's League content to be canon, but hey, I kind of do. It's published by Wizards of the Coast and is considered official play, so there it is. But in the adventure, the Wizards of Thay are about to open the door in order to release Dendar into the world, which they are totally cool in doing because Dendar will devour the sun and usher an age of darkness, at least that's what the prophecy says, and that sounds pretty swell for the liches that rule Thay. They quite like the darkness, so it seems. But now, the adventure is interesting because you actually get to see all of the defenses that Uptau has set to guard the door, and you even get to interact with an aspect of Uptau himself. Uh, the conversation actually reveals that Uptau does not have the power to stop Dendar if she were to escape, which does appear to line up with the prophecy. We also get a stat block for Dendar as a challenge rating 30 monster, though it is important to note that the challenge rating is not actually indicative of her true power. Uh, this challenge rating alongside the stats for Dendar here as they are given are meant to only be referenced for the very small amount of time in which Dendar escapes through the doors. Uh, this is not meant to be Dendar's true form, as it appears that the main which Uptel has created somehow weakens her to a mere CR 30 monster. So if you fight her in the adventure and you reduce all of her hit points to zero, all you're actually doing, according to the adventure, is that you're managing to successfully push her back towards the doors, for the doors to then close and prevent her from leaving, so you don't actually get to defeat her real body, or, or even come remotely close to killing her. I just wanted to put that out there because I know that some of you will comment that how is it possible that a monster with a CR 30 stat block is going to destroy the universe, but it's not supposed to be her real form. But anyways, the adventure also shows in no uncertain terms how Dendar would actually start that apocalypse. Quote, The night serpent rises into the sky, growing ever more in size. Her jaws spread wide. The primordial swallows the sun as the world looks on in horror. Before the world freezes and all life dies, 
The Eater of Worlds wraps her endless coils around Toril and squeezes until the world shatters into millions of pieces of floating rock. A lucky few manage to escape through portals to other planes, but in the realms, nothing living survives." End quote. That is the power of Dendar, the Night Serpent. And the chilling part is that this is not the end. Like we mentioned before, Dendar the Night Serpent is actually Nidhogg the Serpent Worm, and as Ragnarok unfolds, Nidhogg is destined to eat through Yggdrasil and destroy it. So now that Dendar is no longer imprisoned, she can leave the other planes and move about willingly. Uh, we don't know if this happens before or after or even during the events that unfold at Ragnarok in Isgard. We know that this is part of Ragnarok, but we don't know exactly when it happens. If Dendar eats through Yggdrasil before Ragnarok, that would actually explain why the Norse deities are not able to properly fight against Loki, his sons, and the giants and the armies of Hell, since presumably they would have lost much of their power as the Great Tree dies. But if Dendar eats through Yggdrasil after Ragnarok, then another very interesting window opens. See, and this is actually outside of the spectrum of D&D, but, but I do find this fascinating. Ragnarok as a concept has a lot to do with rebirth, right? It's the idea that all must burn so that something new can grow from the ashes. Uh, some say that there's even like a cyclical aspect to it, where Ragnarok will repeat over and over again, always creating something new. Now, there is an interpretation of one of the ancient Nordic poems that mentions Nidhogg that I find to be very fascinating. See, the poem goes, from below, the dragon dark comes forth, Nidhogg flying from Nithfjol. The bodies of men on his wings he bears, the serpent bright, but now I must sink. Uh, there is an interpretation of this as a redemption of the serpent, uh, basically Nidhogg flying away from hell, shedding off the corpses around it as it flies up to the point where she shines, perhaps maybe even beautifully. Now, I bring this up because according to Ragnarok in D&D, a searcher sort of wins the battle, and he burns the world. Now, this feels very much feasible thanks to the great powers that are obtained by ruling Isgard, powers granted, of course, by Yggdrasil. Whoever controls Isgard gains these powers as it behooves the strongest warrior, that is the law of Isgard. Might makes right. If you have the power to defeat Odin, then you deserve Odin's power. So, Searcher would become powerful enough to be able to potentially bring war to the Outer Plains and maybe even burn the universe. But eventually, of course, the world would eventually cool off. Thrym, in fact, would freeze it as, as Ragnarok's prophecy demands, but we don't know what happens after, other than the world would have some kind of rebirth in which something else would come forward. Now, we don't know if this new world is going to be good or bad. We just know that a new world is going to happen. But how does it happen? Why would Swarcher or Thrym stop burning or freezing the world? What incentive would they have? Well, this is perhaps where Nidhogg, where Dendar, comes in. If Dendar eats Yggdrasil after Ragnarog, that would mean that Searcher and Thrym would lose the power granted to them by Yggdrasil, effectively and perhaps inadvertently saving the universe. It's a very interesting concept, you know, li li likely not to be true, but, but it's interesting to at least think about nonetheless. The concept of Dendar kind of just being like a hero that is the one that ushers the rebirth of the world by effectively dismantling the power that grants the giants their abilities. But anyways, let me read you this really cool quote as well. Quote, the Night Serpent is said to be the harbinger of the end of the world, so that when she has swallowed enough nightmares, she will come forth from her lair to douse all of existence in darkness and fear. Even the gods will be unable to stop her, because they are subject to the same nightmares as the mortals who serve them." End quote. The reality is that Dendar is probably no hero. It is not described why in particular she likes eating suns, but I would imagine that it makes her more powerful to do so. After all, she does become more powerful by eating dreams. So if that's the case, what kind of powers would she get by eating the sun or eating Yggdrasil? What can very well be, if not the biggest source of power within the multiverse? If she already has the power to literally just become large enough to swallow a sun and construct an entire planet into destruction, then how powerful would she be after eating Yggdrasil? 
that is how the universe could very well end. Now, Dendar is somehow connected to the Forgotten Realms, as she appears to be able to eat the nightmares of those who reside within it. And when given the chance, she very specifically seeks to eradicate this one very specific world. The question is why, but the answer is non-existent. Adindar has been fighting over this world since the literal creation of this one solar system, and we have to sit there scratching our heads as to the why. We know that during some of the subsequent battles between the deities and the primordials that happened after, that some primordials chose to simply destroy the world of Toril rather than just allow the deities to possess it. Which of course sounds like what Dendar also wants to do in the end. We also know that Dendar is a very dangerous opponent for gods to face, since she has a power that bypasses deific defenses, but for the most part she has been unable to interact much with deities thanks to her imprisonment. We know that she has a manifestation on the Fugue Plane, which is likely to be her real spiritual body, unable to leave the Outer Planes. We also know that the Fugue Plane is indeed connected to Hades, or the Grey Waste as it is also known, which is where the roots of Yggdrasil are found. We know that in its imprisonment, Dendar is still able to move throughout the lower planes at will, but can't quite fully leave it, and we know that she has been attempting to eat Yggdrasil, but has been so far unsuccessful. Now, the reason Dendar has been unsuccessful in eating Yggdrasil is because the Norns, the three gods of fate from the Nordic Pantheon, heal the tree whenever it is damaged. But of course, if Ragnarok were to happen and the Nordic gods were to lose power, the presumption here is that the Norns would either perish themselves or lose their power, at which point point, Dendar would be able to finally eat the tree. We don't know if the tree getting eaten comes first, or if Dendar escaping into the Forgotten Realms and eating the sun comes first, but both are acceptable hypotheses as to how Dendar obtains enough power to fulfill the end of the world prophecy. Now, if you guys are interested in checking out her abilities and stats, I, I do highly recommend checking out the Champions of Ruin book, where she is described in very great detail, including how long she is, what her active abilities are, and how to introduce her into your world. Uh, there's another Elder Evil that is described in that book as well, that is Kesev the Chaos Hound, which is supposed to be Fenrir, the son of Loki who devours Odin, but, but unlike Dendar, who is directly tied to Nidhogg, the connections between Kesev and Fenrir are a bit awkward. Like, they're literally meant to be the same creature, like they're both the monster dog that ate Tyr's hand and they were both tricked into becoming chained up. But Planescape has Fenrir imprisoned in Isgard, while Kesev is imprisoned in the Lower Plains. Uh, there's also conflicting information as to who imprisoned them and who created them, so it is just kind of awkward. But yeah, you can read about it in there too, it's really interesting. Now of course, uh, this is not the only end of the world scenario that D&D has proposed for us. We of course have Tharis Dune, we have Cronus, we have Ariman. there's all kinds of very evil enemies that all have the potential to make this happen. But the reason I find this one so particularly interesting it is because it is a prophecy whose lore has self-confirmed to be not just true but inescapable and a piece of lore that has been confirmed throughout not just multiple books but books within multiple campaign settings from the setting agnostic books of D&D to Planescape to even the Forgotten Realms but of course we have no reason to necessarily believe that this will happen now or within the next thousand or even million years and parts of these prophecies could be interpreted in very funky ways so you know who knows though to be fair the description that we were given from the Turn Back the Endless Night adventure from Adventures League was very specific and left absolutely no vagueness in how the serpent was going to destroy the planet. So that is probably going to happen exactly as it was described. Now, we are not done with Isgard. In fact, we're going to be diving deeper into Isgard on our next video as we usually do for our Outer Plains content. But I just figured that I would make this into a three-parter so that I could include Ragnarok and Nidhogg within it. I figured that you guys would be okay with that and that you would all enjoy it. But yeah, next video we will talk about the Valkyries and Asgard and how Isgard actually looks like and all that normal good stuff. Look forward to it. For those of you who missed it, we just released our new PDF on Monster Classes, Monster Classes 2, and on this PDF I have for you guys dragons, ogres, and lycanthropes. The time is nigh for you guys to start playing ogres. We need more fun ogres around in campaigns. Now for those of you who don't know what this is, basically I have created a way for you to effectively play as monsters in your D&D games. Uh, these monster classes take on the form of your race and your class. So in the case of the ogre, for example, your, your race would be ogre and your class would be ogre. They're not necessarily 
necessarily balanced for multi-classing, but then again, 5th edition is not really balanced for multi-classing anyway, so you could do it, it works. But yeah, each of these monsters have 20 full levels and full racial abilities described for you, including tons of lore that I have salvaged from the ancient tomes of Dungeons & Dragons to help you better play these monsters. I've also designed rollable tables to better create your characters. So you know those tables from the player's handbook, uh, the tables that you find on their background? Yeah, I, I basically created a ton of those for each of the monsters so that you can design monster-specific backstories for your characters. All of them, of course, uh, super lore-friendly. Uh, all of this has been written by me personally. I spent forever getting this together, so there's no better way to support the channel and what I do than uh, checking some of these PDFs out. It really means a lot. Uh, the reception so far has been incredible. I, I am so happy that you guys are loving them. Thank you so much for the support, guys. I truly mean it. You guys are all the best. Thank you very much. I would like to thank my Patreon supporters, Barry Maskand, 5e e Magic Shop, Morgan Johnson, Rusty Rain, Doc Feeder, The Great Codini, Omega Scales, Terry Culp, Benjamin Bosters, Falky951, Ordorix, Abim Korshap, Thomas Hunt, Solas Rider, Lost Crusader, Stalia, Steven, Treb909, Trevor Hess, The Living Guild Pack, Describe, Herbert Johnson, The Wizard's Vault, James the Perverted, Shoddy Cast, Jesse Feliziano, Lucas Syrek, Nakto Rashura, John Harley, John the Wicked, Shane and Sam Skinner, Sir Ignatius Thunderblade, Warren Smith, Arook, Alisa Kestrel, Kristen Coleman, Lactose D Intolerant, Flame Black 200, Murden Games, Falcon Scientist, Hound Song Games, Liberty or Death, Robert T, and Richard Sawyer for supporting me on Patreon at the $25 level. If you would like to support me as well, then please head on over to patreon.com slash MrRex to support. Alright guys, thank you so much for being here, thank you so much for being awesome, and I'll see you all next time.